Hello. Hi. We're going to get started. Um, welcome to the fall 2023 Parsons Communication Design Lecture Series. My name is Elaine Lopez, and I am the Associate Director of the Communication Design BFA program. The lecture series <laughs> allows students to meet design thinkers and practitioners within the discipline and adjacent fields. You can learn more about the upcoming lectures from the CD app and watch past lectures from our YouTube channel. Our next lecture will feature Reggie James and Luca Rapola from Eternal on Tuesday, November 7th, um, between 7 and 8 p.m. in Kaplan Hall. I am thrilled to introduce today's speaker, Ben Denzer. Ben Denzer is an artist, designer, and publisher interested in books, uh, the physicality of images, playing with value, focusing a view, and finding moments of humor. He studied architecture and visual arts at Princeton and received an MFA in graphic design from RISD, where he made a thesis book that was physically larger than the RISD library. Ben has worked as a book cover designer within the Penguin Art Group and is a frequent visual contributor to the New York Times and the New Yorker. He designs and publishes Catalog Press, a small edition artist press, and runs the Instagram called Ice Cream Books. Ben has taught courses at SVA, Parsons, RISD, and the Center for Book Arts, and has been an artist in residence at Mount Auburn Cemetery and the Broad Institute of MIT at Harvard. Ben's work has been collected by the Met, the Guggenheim, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, uh, and the University of Oxford, among other institutions. His work has been recognized by the Type Directors Club, the Art Directors Club, Young Guns, 16, Society of Illustrators, AIGA, BI, BIGNY, AIAP, and the New York Times. Welcome, Ben. Thanks so much, Elaine and Kelly. I'm super excited to be here. Um, extra excited because this semester I'm teaching a class in the CD department. Um, I'm teaching a section of core type, and the section, I is, the section I teach is section G. And so this is some of my students' work from our first class where we were exploring some of the effects that letters that can produce. The students who are here are pointing out this is my G. And I really love teaching, and along with the Parsons class this semester, I'm also teaching a zines and artist books course at SVA and a professional practice class at, at RISD. And I, you don't have to take ID photos anymore, so I just have this one headshot that I've sent to all these places, which I need to update. So outside of the classroom, I have a studio practice that often revolves around books. I design book covers. I design publications. This is a really tall exhibition catalog. This is a magazine called Book Art Review. It's a space for book art criticism. And these are just a few spreads from the inside from the first issue. I also make editorial illustrations. And a lot of the illustrations I do end up playing with the form and idea of the book in some way. I have an Instagram called Ice Cream Books, which, like it sounds, is a place where I post images of ice cream on books. And then I also make my own books. So I run a small edition press called Catalog Press, where I design and publish books that I mostly bind by hand. So some of the books are catalogs of words. This is a Borges short story called The Witness. It's about a paragraph long, then typeset one word per page, each in a different typeface, then risograph printed in these two kind of vibrant inks. Some books are catalogs of images. This is a book called The Details. It's 2,000 architectural detail photos that I took on my phone over the past few years before I made the book. This is a book called Four Flipbooks. It's a flipbook within a flipbook within a flipbook within a flipbook. And some of the books are catalogs of objects. This is one titled 20 Slices of American Cheese. And this is 20 bound slices of individually wrapped craft American singles. But I also do non-book things. These illustrations were for a recent New York Times Magazine story about money and college access. I do identity design. These are materials from the Center for Book Arts Annual Benefit. These are graphics for a conference. This is a board game I recently designed for a Herman Miller brand video, which should be coming out sometime in December. And this is an ear of corn where I counted all 700, or all, all 477 kernels. But what I want to frame my talk around today is the idea of making schoolwork. I know, you know the audience here is mostly communication design students. I think the whole thesis cohort is here, and there's also a few sections of you know, some sophomore classes. 
So I want to use this talk to get you thinking about your time as students, both by showing you some of the things I made while I was in school, you know, my like schoolwork, but also by showing you some of the ways I was able to make school work for me. I think at its best, you know, school can be this place filled with resources, time, and people. And I think being a student is a great excuse to try new things, you know, and not be too precious with them. And I think school can be the space to make new friends and new work. And you know, for those of you in your thesis year, it can also be a time and opportunity to like step back and reflect a little bit and look at the things you've started to make so far and begin teasing out what might tie them together. So I graduated from undergrad in 2015. I went to Princeton and studied architecture and visual arts. And I was also a member of the Princeton um, Beekeeping Club. And I made them this logo. This is the Princeton crest in the abdomen of the bee. And when I went to college, I didn't know specifically what I wanted to do with my life, you know, but I knew that I liked making objects and images more than I liked writing papers. And so I decided to study architecture because of its studio-based classes. In all the classes I took, you know, I got to make things. So class projects prompted me to learn different processes and tools. One class got me thinking about furniture and scale. In another, I ended up collaborating with ants on a project having them direct a procedure for carving out space. I also took classes in sculpture, which gave me access to a wood shop and became a reason to learn how to pour and work with concrete. And then junior year, you know, everyone who was minoring in visual arts was given a small studio space and simply told you know, to make art. And outside of a specific class prompt, you know, I really struggled to figure out how I might even begin thinking about making something. How am I just gonna start from nothing? Because it's really hard um, for me, at least, to start something, you know, from nothing. So I found, my spell, I found myself spending lots of time in the basement of a bookstore near campus, you know, discovering books with interesting pictures that I could buy for really cheap. And I started collaging with these pictures. As I collaged, I would grab, you know, one image from one book, one image from another, and I would combine the two together. As I was going, you know, as I was making these things, I never really knew ahead of time what would end up you know, making a good or an interesting collage. But you know, just by collaging one thing into another, you know, by making these relatively simple formal moves, I was able to go quickly and to make a, a lot of collages. And I realized the more I looked at this growing pile of images I was making, that I was getting something from the, the size of the pile, from the quantity of them. You know, if I made 500 collages, I could be pretty sure that among them, there'd be one or two good ones. You know, and the quantity of all of them together would also prop up the bad ones. So there are a lot of not interesting, you know, not great collages here, but I think they gain something by being among the whole group. I found this to be true again and again, that if I made drawings, I would get something from making a lot of them. And so I began to work this way, you know, taking a simple procedure and doing it again and again. I mostly worked on paper, making these images and then scanning them into the computer. Um, and Princeton's art department is located in this old elementary schoolhouse um, near campus. It's in, as, you know, as an old building. There's sometimes like bugs that walk around. So one day as I was scanning these collages, I saw a cockroach on the floor. And so I put the cockroach on the scanner to see what would happen. And as the bug you know, crawled this way, the scanner had you know, scanned this way. And the result was this wacky you know, record of the cockroach's movement. And I show this to you not to gross you out, you know, but just to say that another big thing I took away from school was the idea that you never know where an interesting you know, image or idea is gonna come from. And so this experience led me to start scanning everything. You know, this is a caterpillar. This is a worm that did a little wiggle. This is plastic wrap. I scanned a shirt, expanded its pattern, and then printed the pattern on a large format printer to make a wallpaper. When I went home for one winter break, I found some old photos my parents were throwing out. I had a Sharpie, and so I used it as a way to collage into the images. And working in series, you know, again, let me try different things within the same process. When I got back to school, I took one of the old books I had around and Sharpied into that. It's this book of comparative photos taken at two different times. And then I took a printmaking class at Princeton, um, and I had no idea what I wanted to print. So I found you know, some old book pages and printed phrases onto them, using you know, these pages as a canvas on which to place you know, the wood blocks that I created. 
because the pages already had content on them, you know, there was something to work with and work against. As I was doing this, you know, I realized I could make wood blocks that responded specifically to these specific pages I was printing on. You know, I was already scanning the pages you know, to document them at the end of my printing process, but then I started scanning the pages before I did anything to them, then using that page's image to design a wood block that could fit into it perfectly. So because I was also in the architecture department, I had access to laser cutters that I used to carve out the blocks. So on the left is my wood block you know, printing red on top of the image that it's made you know, for, and on the right is that block printed all by itself. And I liked this process, you know, making something specifically for something else, and then seeing what that thing looked like on its own. So this was the final project I made in that printmaking class. I took this old pamphlet from the Mets Arms and Armor Department, and I made three blocks for each spread, and I printed cyan, magenta, and yellow back into the pamphlet. So my intent was to add color to these previously black and white images, but again, I ended up liking the effects of the block print on their own so much better. I liked the oddness of their compositions without the text, you know, the brightness of the colors without the muddy kind of grayscale of, of the grayscale images. And again, this is just to say that I think there's something to following a process, that you may end up somewhere different and maybe you know, more exciting than you initially thought if you just keep going and keep experimenting. So as I made all this work you know, um, in undergrad, I realized that I was gravitating towards books. You know, when I didn't know what to do, I would grab you know, books and collage with their images and grab books and print onto their pages. And it was around this time that I took a graphic design class, and the professor in that class brought a visiting critic who worked at Princeton um, University Press, who was a book cover designer. And it was the first time that I realized, you know, oh my gosh, there's a job where people pay you to read books, think about them, and then make the image that sends you know, the book out into the world. And it sounded like you know, the ideal life to me. So from that point on, I started thinking more consciously about books. And I started turning all of my architecture projects into book projects. So this was an assignment where each student was given a garden to analyze. And I was given this garden called Stowe in England. And I found this old book in the library that had these poems and these little spot illustrations. And so I scanned the book used the, and used the illustrations to make you know, my own series of little pamphlets. So each pamphlet here is a walk on a specific path through a garden. And so this is one pamphlet. So the book's pages are made on vellum. Um, it's printed on vellum. So as you flip through the pages, it's as if you're you know, going on a walk through this garden along this path on maybe like a misty day. And so the paths take you from one architectural folly to the next. And then once you finish the booklet, it becomes this sort of choose your own adventure. And you can select the next path because each of these paths has its own booklet associated with it. So at Princeton, every undergrad writes a kind of written thesis, and as an architecture major, I was able to design my book as well. And so it was exciting and challenging to both you know, craft a written argument and then also you know, put together its physical you know, graphic form. But you know, it was challenging, but I really enjoyed diving into this and making kind of every aspect of a book. And then on the visual arts side of my degree, I found myself again in a blank room, you know, unsure what to, to, what to make. So I returned to this kind of pile of cheap and free books I had been accumulating, and you know, by this time rather, but this time, rather than using the images within them, I thought, you know, I want to treat these as objects. And so I drilled holes into them, I used nails and screws, I dug around the sculpture shop, just grabbing whatever you know, was around for people to use. So there were bolts, there were coat hangers, there were hooks, and there were lots and lots of wheels that I put on books. So these books can roll, roll around. This is an image of the books rolling around. So at the end of the year, each student um, was given a week in the gallery space. And so I decided to use my week um, and present my work as kind of a pop-up shop of sorts. So this was the website for the shop. And I liked the idea of selling the things I was making, you know, partially as a way to make some money because I was graduating from, from school but also just as another way that people could interact with the things I was making. You know, I think having a price on something creates a different kind of engagement. You know, it's not just a matter of do I like this thing that's on the wall in a gallery, but do I want it enough to pay $20 to put it in my house? And so each object has its own page with several images and a description. And these are some installation shots from the week in the gallery space. I was thinking about museum gift shops with this kind of wall of postcards. 
And then during the show, I was there, you know, all week as like a shopkeep of sorts. And I also liked how, you know, by selling the work, it became a reason for me to be there and engage with the people um, when they viewed it. So then I was graduating, you know, from undergrad, and I wanted to find a way to find someone to keep paying me to, you know, play with books. And so I knew I really wanted to get a book cover design job. And I knew to do that, I needed to, you know, make a bunch of fake book covers and create a book cover portfolio. Like something I think that's really true and that I've kind of found to be true is that people will only really pay you to do something once they see that you've already done it. Um, and so I knew I had to make a bunch of fake book covers so that someone would pay me to make real book covers. And then in terms of making a portfolio, I got some good advice while I was in school, which one of my teachers told me to just copy something. You know, and through copying something that I liked, I would kind of figure out how it worked. And then by remaking it, I would end up you know, making it my own through, through the process uh, of doing that. So at the time, I really loved the look of Penguin crime books from like the 60s and 70s. And so I used them as a model for this fake book series. So the New Jersey Transit um, train line is this train system in New Jersey. And these are various stops along the Northeast Corridor. So we have you know, sleigh bells in Secaucus, one-way ticket to Trenton, Metro Park after dark. Um, as, in, as you can see in the top right, the scanned cockroach you know, came in handy again for the Edison exterminator. And so this is another thing I learned in school, which is that you never know when things are going to be useful again. And so I knew I needed to make a bunch of book covers quickly. You know? And so in addition to these you know, New Jersey transit crime books, I looked at what else I had around. And so I had all those 500 plus collages I had made. So I thought, maybe I can add type to some of them, and I can turn them into, into book covers. So I made a Shakespeare series you know, using this group of collages that all kind of use the sepia-toned images with these black and white images. And then I just went through my whole pile kind of looking for what felt like it could work for various famous book titles. You know? So like this one felt like Dracula. That one felt like it could work for Robinson Crusoe. And so while I didn't make the collages you know, with this project in mind, I had them around and realized that they you know, would work for this. And so I used this portfolio to apply to a junior designer position that was opening up at Penguin. And the art directors who interviewed me said, you know, we like your work, but we want to see some examples of you using typography as kind of the main thing. You know, these are all very image-based. So I had this long weekend before my second round interview with like the next higher up person at, at Penguin. And so I you know, tried to make some, some new type-driven book covers. I had this big book of Borges short stories that I really liked. And so I used the titles of these short stories to make some fake covers. You know, having them all be by Borges is a way to have the covers kind of relate in some way. And then I just grabbed everything and anything I had around me. So you know, this is the arms and armor you know, print from my printmaking class that I showed you earlier. On the right, I had some tracing paper. You know, I had some tin foil. I had some post-it notes. I had some duct tape. And there was a short story called The Captive. I had some sriracha and paper towels. I had some you know, noodles. And so I really believe that you know, the combination of a tight deadline and using what you have around often leads to unexpected, you know, really interesting places. So luckily, all of this worked. And I got the job at Penguin, you know, where I was an in-house book cover designer for about three and a half years. And so being a book cover designer is really great, I think. You know, each book is different, so you get to make a range of different things. Some books are you know, serious. Some books are funny. Different genres call for different covers. Nonfiction music books, let me play around you know, like this and like this. Books about our democracy, let me work you know, in a slightly different visual way. And then historical fiction about gangsters and government men in the 1930s you know, lets me do something different still. And unlike architecture, which is super slow, you know, graphic design is really fast. Um, and so these things that I make you know, kind of go quickly into the world, and all of a sudden, they're, they're in a bookstore. And I really like this, this speed. And because the projects are fairly small, I get a large amount of ownership over them. So while these are commercial projects, I'm able to put a lot of myself into them. Sometimes this happens literally. For this cover, I collaged a crowd scene together where Andy Warhol is in four places at once. But if you look hard in the shadows at the very top, you'll see I've snuck in there as well. And I didn't design this cover, but it's a book of humorous stories about the author's dysfunctional family. And when you put people on a book cover, you know, you have to get their approval and you have to kind of clear the rights. 
And one of these authors' cousins wanted nothing to do with the project. But everyone you know, really loved the book cover. The author loved it. Everyone in-house loved it. So we had to replace one of these cousins somehow. So I had a coworker take a photo of my face, and then I photoshopped my facial features onto this cousin's facial structure. Um, and then that's how we did it. But the best part about this was that the author wrote this article for the LA Times, kind of using this as an entry point into her family you know, dysfunction stories. But you know, she didn't know it was my face. So she wrote this article you know, thinking that we had used various stock photos, like a nose from here, a mouth from here. Um, and she named the face Monique. And she said, you know, Monique has a mysterious Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa gaze. But really, it's just, it's just my face. <laughs> but no matter the book cover, every time I start designing, I'm always extremely terrified. You know, just like I was in school, you know, in a blank space told to go make art, you know, when I'm facing a blank InDesign document, you know, it always kind of makes me sweat. So I try to, as much as possible, use the strategy that worked for me when I was in school, which is to try and get away from the blank screen as much as I can and to go out into the world and find something to start from, you know, to get something to work with. And so sometimes it's a block of foam, you know, carving typography into it or painting it. The only problem is that when the editors like this idea, but they want you to change the typeface, you then have to go get another block of foam, you know, and start all over again. But I really love this process of physically making things in, in the real world. And I think I get things from it. I think it's easier for me to make compelling things physically. You know, I wanted this cover to feel like it was behind bubble wrap, so I got some bubble wrap and put, you know, it over the printed type. I could try and model water, you know, on the computer with like a 3D software, or I could just go get some water. Um, I think when you make something physically, you know, it's great because you get these real shadows, you get real edges, and you don't have to work so hard to make things feel real because they are real, you know? But sometimes it takes a lot of balloons to get just the perfect pop. And all this being said, it's not like I don't use a computer. It's just that I don't use a computer in isolation. You know, I'm often projecting something or printing things out and layering them, giving things a real sense of depth, playing with light, letting paper kind of curve and fall, you know, bending it into itself, rolling it, layering it. And just like I was, when I was in school, you know, I found it really useful to take a single process and kind of push on it. Here, I'm using plexiglass sheets to separate printouts on a, on a light table. You know, here, these paper sheets overlap just slightly on different levels of the plexiglass, and you get this almost stained glass quality with the light kind of shining behind it, giving it this glowing or kind of a porcelain look. And I always return to the scanner, using it to put layers between things or play with perspective and blurs. And so one of the great things about working at Penguin was that it let me continue to be a student. So Penguin is this big company that you know, is owned by this German conglomerate, and so it has really good benefits. And so Penguin had this tuition reimbursement program, which meant that I could take classes related to my job, and Penguin would pay for it. So if I was in the accounting department, you know, I could take an accounting class. But since I was in the art department, I could take all these art classes. So I signed up for a photography class um, through SBA's continuing ed program, and then I took a risograph class, and then I took a screen printing class, and then I took a hardcover bookbinding class at Center for Book Arts, which is this great bookbinding and letterpress studio on 27th Street, if you're not familiar with it. Um, but the class really demystified the idea of a hardcover book for me. You know? And before taking this class, um, I thought of this hardcover book as this thing that Penguin made in factories and something you know, I could never you know, produce myself. But all of a sudden, you know, it was now accessible to me. And so I started making my own books, and this led to the catalog press kind of project I briefly mentioned earlier. And then while I was working at Penguin, I also started teaching a little bit and really enjoyed it. The first class I taught was here at Parsons. Then I started you know, also teaching at SVA. And I really liked the process of teaching and knew I always wanted it to be kind of a part of my life. And so this desire to teach more led me to kind of return to be a student myself to get an MFA at RISD. And I graduated last year. But I also went back to school because I wanted to kind of use it as a time to expand the scope of my work. You know, I wanted to be a student again, to build on top of all these book-related projects, um, but also to make new bodies of work outside of them, to figure out what these new you know, works might be, to dig past the book as this primary connecting tissue that linked all of my work together and see what else might be out there. So unlike you know, starting undergrad, 
Going to grad school, especially after having spent some time you know, working in the world, I think I had a stronger sense of what I wanted you know, to get out of school before I went in. And so I had this rough outline of how I wanted to make school work for me. Um, but I also knew that my thoughts and ideas would change along the way. And I was really excited for that process. I think school is as much about the people you meet and spend time with as it is about the things that you learn and, and the things that you make. And so grad school, I think, is especially this way. I think the people matter a lot. And luckily for me, you know, as part of this great cohort at RISD, this is all of us from four sides. And so having entered the profession of graphic design somewhat sideways through architecture, uh, one of the things I wanted to do more directly in school was play with type. So I made a variable font for the first time. Scanned times, as I call it, mimics poorly scanned PDFs. How type doesn't really scan well near the gutter. And so this is it on a website, uh, responding to the changing size of a page. But having worked with graphic design you know, and making book covers before grad school, in many of my studio classes, I tried to find ways to explore processes that I wasn't so familiar with. So maybe start with books, but end up somewhere completely different. So this project started in the Providence Public Library and ended with me making paper models of objects in my dad's office. I would have him take these photos and send them to me, and then I would unfold his photos in Photoshop, print them out, and, and remake them as these kind of miniature paper models. And I really fell in love with this, this process. These are all the objects I made. And I used them in this short film. Um, for me, the project was really a, a way to preserve them. Excitingly, the project also led to a whole new body of commercial illustration work. So these are also paper models made from photographs that my dad sent me. I made editorial illustrations before getting, M MF before getting an MFA at RISD, but most of the jobs I would get would all be related to articles you know, around books. But this process of making that I developed you know, in my RISD studio work opened up this whole new avenue in my commercial practice. And I've ended up making a lot of illustrations using this technique. This is one I just um, made and sent off to this publication called The Architect's Newspaper. I think it comes out later this month. During a different RISD class, um, I gathered images of old chromolithographs, family registries, wedding certificates, and other ornamented sheets. And I printed them out and cut out their contents, leaving just their frames. And then I photographed them stacked between plexiglass sheets. These are their backs. So here I was playing with expanding that process you know, I first developed at Penguin making book covers. And I recently used this technique to make an editorial illustration for The Bachelor magazine. And so again, I like having this porous boundary between my personal and, and commercial work. In another grad studio class, I continued playing with printed paper. But I started experimenting with scale. So I photographed a corner of you know, the graphic design studio where there was a recycle bin. And then I printed out this corner kind of one-to-one -one on tabloid-sized tabloid sheets of paper. And then I photographed these printed sheets in different locations, uh, in a bathroom on the left and on a car on the right. And this is in the RISD Museum Auditorium. And then I continued this body of work through a photography course. But instead of recycling bins, I photographed my fellow grad students and our amazing program coordin coordinator, whose name is Eva. I really enjoyed making these photographs. And it was great photographing friends. I wanted to keep playing in this direction, so I tried to find ways to work this project into, into different classes, trying to push the process with each iteration to see how far I could go with it. As I've hopefully started to show you, you know, I really believe in experimentation and play, and in just doing things you know, and seeing what happens. I think the more that I make, the more this body of printed work you know, reinforces each other and kind of all relates to each other. And I see it all as related, through its materiality, through its process. I really like its imperfections, the edges and reflections that you get from the paper, the moments of seeing what is paper and what is not, and its potential for odd humor. Along with this printed paper kind of body of work, during my time at RISD, I was also playing with money. So this is Kozo paper um, with coin inclusions that I made in a paper making class. This is a swatch of knotted nickels that I made in a textiles class. 
I really like the textiles department at RISD, and so these were some patterns I, I made in a pattern making class. RISD also has a lot of great tools, um, and so these are patterns printed onto coins using a UV printer. And it took quite a while to get the system of alignment just right. In textiles, I also took a digital, digital embroidery class. So I spent my time on the digital embroiderer machine, you know, embroidering onto one and two dollar bills. Like the coins, you know, I left some elements untouched. And then I continued these experiments in a screen printing course. Printing, on, printing two colors onto, onto bills. And screen printing goes a lot faster than embroidery. These are Lincoln's eyes peeking out. Looking through RISD's course catalog, um, I saw a class on public art taught by the artist Janet Zweig. And um, I signed up because it sounded you know, really interesting. I kind of didn't know much about public art. And it was probably my favorite class in all of grad school. It got me thinking about scale and audience and time in a way that I hadn't before. This was part of an installation of coins in semi-public spaces. This is a larger scale project titled Brown University, had 28,290 windows. It's 207 three by one inch plaques. And so, you know, one year in grad school, I counted all the number of windows on each building that Brown University owns. And I think you can collect something, you know, by counting it, by making a record. And so if you walk around, you know, Brown University's campus, you'll find these kind of tucked away on each building. And I like that they're each one simple dry statement, how as a collection, you know, they're kind of absurd. And I like that they kind of also point towards something to be noticed, how they're a bit of a prod. So RISD was also a time for me to think about my work and my practice, to look at all the work, all the things I had been making, and start to make some sense of it, to think about the relationships between the things that I make. So there were classes that pushed me to start you know, articulating what I think about the things I make, and I found it really useful to start writing in descriptions of a few of my projects. And then approaching my final year at RISD, each student you know, is tasked with producing a thesis. And I really struggled with figuring out what a thesis was you know, and what I could do with it. You know, I knew each you know, student made a book and each student's book goes into the library, but I was skeptical kind of about the form of the thesis itself and you know, felt it somehow to be constrained within the institution and maybe tied down by the specific academic disciplinarity. And I really just didn't want my thesis to feel like it was schoolwork. I wanted it to be useful in the context of RISD, you know, as schoolwork, um, but I also wanted it to be useful for me outside of RISD's walls. In some ways, I think the graduate thesis as a form, you know, is a bit of a spectacle, in kind of. It's kind of like a performance of academic accomplishment. And so I wanted to lean into that. And so leaning into it, I made a thesis that was bigger than the RISD library, because normally the thesis books go into the RISD library. And so RISD's you know, main library, fleet library, is this large cavernous room, and it's 180 by 114 feet. And so when opened, my thesis book is 200 feet by 125 feet. Um, this is some drone documentation, thanks to RISD's excellent drone pilot, Stephen Cook. And so when the book opens, it contains kind of the standard thesis signature page content. Like it says, this thesis is you know, submitted in partial requirement for the degree of Master of the Fine Arts, blah, blah, blah. And then it has you know, the signatures of my advisors and my external critic. And as you can see here, it takes at least four people to turn the page. And I kind of committed to this idea of saying, I, as a joke, like I wanna make my thesis that's bigger than the library. And I told too many people that, and then I finally looked up how big the library was. But at that point, I was, I was already committed. And you can see we got kind of lucky with the wind blowing just the perfect amount. But I really wanted the scale you know, here to be the primary statement. So this is me and my friend Zach standing on the cover. So the book's pages are composed of 52 10 by 50 foot rolls of white overwintering plastic, which is kind of made for greenhouses. Um, altogether, you know, all, all of it kind of weighs over 800 pounds. And to make the book, I slowly trace the letters onto each roll of plastic you know, using a projector kind of like this, but, but smaller. And so I made a system of registration marks so that I could roll the plastic on tubes. And then these outlines, you know, of type were filled in. And I was super lucky that I had a lot of help. You know, I could not have made this without so many generous friends. 
And so the project was this nonstop you know, physical activity for a whole month, and this kind of crazy last day of construction where it almost didn't come together, but then it came together. Um, and so it was the most physically exhausting thing I think I've ever done, but I'm really glad that, that I did it. So along with being a performance of academic accomplishment, I think the form of a thesis can also be an opportunity to present kind of a narrative around one's work. And so in addition to kind of making this crazy like singular statement, I also wanted to use my time at RISD you know, to, to, to make a thesis in this way. So I made another book, which I think of as an artist talk. So this is the front and the spine. This is the back and the foredge. The jacket wraps all the way around. On the foredge is a link to watch a video of the book being performed. And on the flaps are my abstract, which describe the contents. It starts with, this is an artist talk contained within a book. It is 816 pages and 49 minutes long. Closed captions run along the spreads. The back flap contains a list of thanks, an attempted list of all the people who made RISD a great experience for me. And so in designing the book, I really wanted to make it feel like a talk, a book that felt like a slide lecture. So you can read it as an object, but it's really meant to be watched or performed, um, watched as a video or, or performed live. So a link to its performance is also on the back. And it takes you to this page on my website where you can click play, um, and the talk begins on, on the cover. And it's called Making Then Meaning. So this talk is an attempt to make some sense of my work and myself. I spend my days making things, but I've never really had a good answer to questions of why I make the things I make or what their meaning is. I don't think there are simple answers to these questions. I think meaning comes from accrual, from the piling up of time, experiences, objects, and images. I've been obsessively making objects and images for as long as I can remember, obsessively collecting and piling things up. I want to be understood, I think we all do, and as I try to present and make some sense of my current work, I think any real understanding or meaning is only gonna come from confronting the entire pile of things I've made, from seeing everything as an aggregate. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show a lot of images, flip these pages quickly, and start when the piles were small. So grad school is great because it gave me you know, the space to begin articulating this narrative around my practice as a whole. And I'm not gonna read the whole book now. You know, It exists as a video online if you'd like to watch it. But I am gonna excerpt just a few of the more direct statements and claims within it. So I believe in a sort of coherentism. Coherentism is a term I learned in an undergrad philosophy class. It's a theory of knowledge that says that justification for beliefs comes from the coherence of a system rather than on truth emanating from any one foundational belief. Basically, it means that things prop each other up, that there is no meaning delivered from on high. It's a web of connections all the way down. I think this relates to the body of work a person makes. I think if you make enough, connections will bubble up. Sometimes these connections are formal. Sometimes content binds things together. Sometimes color, or a process, or a movement, a sense of humor, a way of treating the frame. But I think if there is enough, things will start to speak to each other. For me, making is responding responding to context, to constraints, to things that come before, to things that exist. Sometimes it's, a, a, sometimes it's a specific moment, like Andy Warhol using ketchup, or a specific text, like Harold Bloom's The Anxiety of Influence. This is the book in a block of resin um, held open to a particular page that influenced how I think about things. But often, I find myself responding formally. These are glass bottles whose bottoms I've stretched. This is embroidery on a $2 bill. I think there's a power to limiting the number of formal moves one makes. I think you get something from the legibility. This is screen printing on a $1 bill. This is UV printing on US coins. I also think you get something from commitment and rigor, that as these simple moves aggregate within a series and across bodies of related work, that they reinforce and they buoy each other. I think with quantity, there's less to explain because more is plainly apparent. 
Rather than being told what to pay attention to, an understanding of intentionality comes from seeing what relationships are held consistent. I think design is relationships between people, histories, contexts, and forms. For me, graphic design is a process of gathering, experimenting, collaging, iterating, and editing. As a book cover designer, I used to get sad when a book cover I was excited about got killed and never made it out into the world. But now I just keep these designs around and in my mind, knowing that I might find a way to reuse them in the future. I think reusing things, and more importantly, knowing that I could reuse them, allows me to see everything as useful. It's a way of working that means nothing is a waste. It's all just experiments that either work out or get added to this pile I could pull from later. I think working as a designer has made me realize how flexible meaning is. Every book is unique, but abstractions and visual effects are stretchy. Meanings change depending on audience, context, and time, depending on what is around what. I think the slipperiness I found in design has shaped how I think about meaning in all the things I make. These are spreads from a book I made called 2,222 Accidental Vanity Plates. They're license plates that all say things that I don't think their owners paid for them to say. License plates that have meanings that have shifted over time. I think all meaning works like this. It changes. It shifts. It depends on the person looking and the context they put it in. I think this is why I put more weight on form and craft, on quantity and scale. I think these things are more immediate and more durable than spending too much time trying to constrain the meaning or reading of a project. I think more comes from the legibility of simple moves. I think small formal decisions, somewhat brutally followed, create a sense of intentionality, which is one of the ways I think about craft. I think craft is feeling a process, a felt intentionality, a clarity of relationships, a presence of some humanity. This is 6,000 Dandelions. It's a book of 6,000 pressed and dried dandelions laminated between plastic sheets. Without knowing the book's context, I think you feel its scale and its contained time. But if I tell you these dandelions were picked from Mount Auburn Cemetery during the brief few weeks when they bloom before turning to seeds and blowing away, and if I tell you that I finished the book right around the 600,000 COVID death mark in the US, I think more meanings latch themselves onto the object. While these meanings are important, I think they're, I think they're also extra to a certain extent. I think you feel something without them because of the quantity of the dandelions because of the bigness of the object, because of the large roundness of the number. 6,000 individual dandelions, row after row. I believe things mostly live in pictures. I think documentation is as important as the work itself. I know this may seem opposed to my embrace of the real and the physical, but I see it as an acknowledgement of how our world works. More people will see the images of what I make you know, than the real things. And I think the images will outlive the objects. I like the way images can preserve their contents. This is mostly how I use pictures. I photograph things I want to remember on my phone. Since 2011, I've been uploading an image and a quote for each day onto a website. It started as a Tumblr blog and has turned into something else. I take all the photos and screenshots I've made on a particular day and collage them together into a single image. The project lives on this site that Eric Lee helped me build. You can look at them by day or by month. You can search and sort. This is every day I've, I've been in Providence. These are the images I've tagged with spiral. And I know it's a bit obsessive, um, but I think I get things from it. It's become a way for me to record a way for me to hold on to what I see and hear, a way of collecting my references together. And maybe most of all, it's become a way for me to use these things, a way for me to make something from and with them. For me, I think it's this making that's the most important thing. And I think it's this making that to a certain extent also makes me. 
I mean this in a straightforward way, where if you make book covers, people think of you as a book cover designer. If you make illustrations, people call you an illustrator. But I also think it's a little more encompassing than that. I think what and how you make is what you pay attention to, what you spend your time on. And I think that, to a large extent, is what makes a person. I think people are aggregates and piles. This project is me as a pile of images and a pile of words. In some ways, I think, me, I think making can also be a reason for living. I don't have time to give you the whole story here, but these are postcards and a commemorative coin, coin sold by a person named Joe Mikulik 100 years ago. He was born in Croatia and decided to walk around the whole world. He sold these postcards to fund his journey and his life, and as he walked from place to place, he carried this large book where he gathered signatures. The signatures and notes contained in this massive physical object served as a record of his journey, but I think also as his rationale and his excuse. This object is the thing that allowed him to travel, to interact, to engage, and to live. It was his reason and his meaning. I stumbled upon his story a few years ago and dove into some archives trying to find his large book. Excitingly, it recently resurfaced, and I worked with its current owners this past summer um, to photograph every page of it. I really like his story because for me, it's an example of how making can be meaning and can be living. So I plan to continue my 2011 to present project until I die. I think it only becomes more impactful as the images and quotes pile up, as time piles on. I'm 31 now, and so hopefully, you know, I'm still in the middle of things. And I'm still figuring out what my practice might be about. I know that the meanings that I pull from it and the meanings that other people pull from it will change as time goes on. But for now, I'm not so worried about that. So far, I find enough personal meanings in my work to keep moving. And I have a faith that if I keep going, if I keep making, keep gathering, keep collecting, keep looking, keep responding, and keep doing all of these things with some sort of intentionality, with some sort of rigor and play, that it will all pile up in some useful way, and that enough meaning will ultimately come from it. So thanks for listening, and that's it. I think we have a little bit of time for Q&A. They're waiting for the mic, yeah. Hi, Ben. Um, Hi. Wow, first of all, that was really amazing. I took a lot of notes, and I feel like I learned so much just the past hour. I have a lot of questions, but I think I have two. Um, for everyone, first of all, I feel like you probably don't use any mock-ups when documenting your works because everyone is like, every one of your work is like individually very unique, right? Um, do you have any tips for documenting or recording um, or photographing your works, because I feel like it's a crucial skill to have as a communication design student. And secondly, you seem to spend a lot of time making things and designing things like for fun, that is, like, even if it's not school related. Um, do you find to like, I mean, do you have any time to find yourself like doing other things that it's not related to art, like any other hobbies that is outside the... <laughs> Because I'm curious, I feel like you just spend so much time, like, I mean, it seems like you dedicate a lot of time just making art, and I was wondering if you ever, like, have time to do other things. Totally. I'm just genuinely both, curious. <laughs> both great questions. Um, for the documentation, I think a key for, you're right that I don't use mock-ups, really. Um, sometimes I end up kind of making my own mock-ups, where, like, if I'm taking book cover photos, sometimes I get a good shadow on one, and then I'll kind of Photoshop a photo of another book cover onto that shadow. But the key is really just to have good lighting. Um, and so I didn't show many of the ice cream book photos, but if you go to ice cream books on Instagram, all of those photos are taken outside in direct sunlight because I wanted like a harsh shadow. And so, you know, the sun is a great, you know, light. Um, and then something I, I did that helped me a lot is I bought two really cheap flashes, which just kind of blast a room with bright light. But it's really just about 
having, having good lighting. And then in terms of doing other things, it's true that you know, a lot of my time is spent you know, making all these stuff, but I do find time to, to do, do other stuff. Um, I like to go on lots of walks. Right now, my, my wife is in her medical um, internship, and so she's very busy too, so some of my, our busyness kind of overlap. Um, but I like hanging out with friends, you know, going to movies, having people over for dinner, the usual kind of hanging out stuff. Yeah. I don't currently teach a junior class, but maybe next semester, we'll see. Um, I love all of the projects that you've shown, and I'm really curious if you ever get bored. If I ever get bored. I think some of the, like one rationale of doing lots of things at once is it prevents you from getting bored, and it also makes it so that when I'm bored or when I'm like stuck and frustrated on one thing, I can do something else that still feels productive for me. Like, that's kind of the, the thing I showed at the end where I make this like crazy photo. I don't do that every day. Sometimes I fall behind and then I, I catch up. Um, but having a project like that where I could always be working on something that would be useful um, for my kind of like life and practice allows me to, when I'm stuck on a book cover design, be able to do something else for a little bit and then go back to it. So I think of it in the same way as boredom. When I'm bored with one thing, um, I try and not like force myself to do it, but by having multiple things, be on board with something else. Thank you. I think this is a tangent from the first question, but I think especially following the theme of like being students, something that I'm sure uh, me and I'm sure a lot of other people here um, struggle with is managing time. And especially with how like crazy and amazing your projects are, I was wondering like, how do you, how did you manage time as like a student with like a busy schedule and like experimenting and doing all that crazy stuff while still submitting things on time and stuff, yeah. Totally, yeah. I think some of it is trying to understand that you know not everything has to be crazy precious. Like if you don't have a huge amount of time for a project, you know, sometimes it's freeing to think like, this doesn't have to be the perfect you know, thing for my portfolio. Um, I'll do what I can in the time you know, provided. Um, but now managing time, I find just like something that is useful for me is setting little timers so I know that like 15 minutes has elapsed um, is when I'm really busy with stuff and I know like I need to be doing multiple things and then I find myself that that just helps because it goes off as I'm looking at Instagram and I'm like, oh, I should be back to my, you know, the thing I have to do before this specific time. Um, okay. But yeah, I think, and I think also just having a way to give yourself a break when you are like stressed and it doesn't feel like you're spending so much productive time is something I've also found really useful. So whether that's working on something else or whether that's going out, you know, and getting, you know, a coffee or going out and, you know, going on a walk around the block um, or doing some like cleanup thing around the house, you know, I think there's getting yourself out of the stuck mode is also a way to kind of be more productive. Um, I had a question about um, like your, so it seems like a lot of the stuff that you do make is like very like you you like you pick the content. It's like something that you decided was interesting, and then you picked what you wanted to design. So like, how do you kind of like decide like where you want to like when you wanted to like focus on making your own content versus like making something for somebody else's content, like for like book design? Yeah. Um, and that's again where it's like, it's hard to start in a vacuum. Um, and so for me, I, it's most exciting when the one thing can kind of lead to another. Um, like I didn't show it in here, but I have a book that's a catalog press book where I take stamp design. And I take stamps that are really cool and I kind of edit out the, the image or the text content. So all you're left with is the, like the composition of the stamp. And so I made a book of like 3000 stamps like this, which was like something I did in my own time that I kind of liked as this artwork thing. But that idea came from working on a book cover where I was doing a book cover that revolved around letters and so I needed some stamp graphics. So I realized that when I removed the content on stamps, you know, it looked cool for this book cover, but it could be something that would be worth exploring more um, in the future. And the question was, I feel like I've drifted away from the question. The question was like, how do you come up with things?
Gotcha, gotcha. I think I've always wanted to have a little bit, I think it comes from like a desire for control, probably, of, you know, when you're working as a designer and someone's telling you you have to work with this content, I always wanted to also have something that I could have full kind of ownership over. Um, so for me, it was a process of like, I started the ice cream books when I was at Penguin, you know, and that was kind of my outlet of doing like a weird art thing. And then I, you know, it was kind of related to the thing I was doing because I, there was a free bookshelf at Penguin, so that's where I got all the books to put ice cream on um, initially. And so I think it's a matter of, for me, it was a matter of finding something that I could do that maybe I was relating to some of the things I was doing around, but that I then had control over. You previously spoke about having a sense of play within your designs, and when designing book covers, I see that some of the topics are touched are on more of the serious side. I was wondering how you approach those designing those covers with a sense of play or incorporating play or fun while also staying on the serious side, and if there's a different approach you go with those covers, or is there always room for play. Totally. Um, I think there's always room for play, but I think it's a, it's like a different kind of play. Like sometimes it's, I think, a matter of, I think you can be playful in a graphic way in the, in the sense that like things become unexpected or like the colors are maybe um, something that's doing something, but it doesn't always have to have like a clown nose, you know, on it type of play. Um, and so for me, I still find it productive, even on like the serious book covers to like, give myself the freedom to like play as the designer making things on my own. Um, and then it's more in the process of like, once I've made a bunch of stuff looking at it, then like of editing down, no, oh, this is a little too cheesy or not serious enough. Um, but I think even with serious books, you want them to stand out in some way among the other serious books and you want them to still be, at least I like as a designer, like selfishly want it to be interesting and want it to be like a little weird. Um, and so that's what I try and bring to it, but within the parameters of however serious you know it is. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Ben. Um, you have such a huge body of work. Um, how do you maintain that intentionality after you're repeating the same thing, like a large amount of times in the process? How do I maintain the intentionality after yeah. a large amount of times? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I kind of, I clearly am just like a little obsessive, and so I kind of lean into the large amount of times. And for me, a lot of the intentionality comes from the large amount of you know things that, that happen. Um, but I guess if your question is also like, how do I like keep it up? Like sometimes I, I kind of I don't. You know, sometimes it's like there's different pots on on the fire at once, and so. I used to post like three ice cream book photos to Instagram every week, and then it was you know once a week, and now and it was once a month, and I haven't posted one since like last December. Um, but I, I kind of want that project to stay alive, so I, like, I should, I wanna find time to do it, but sometimes it's letting things simmer and turn down while other things go up. Um, so yeah. I think that might be I think that's it. I think so up. too. So another round of applause for Ben. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you so much for, I know a lot of you have to be here, but thank you for being here nonetheless. Um, if people have more questions you didn't get to, I can hang around and, and chat with people. Um, but thanks again. Thanks friends.